Well, okay then. <laughs> I guess it was just a matter of time until we got to newcomer prostitutes. And how's my little princess? Do I have to go? Yes, honey. This one seems pretty young. Is this gonna be like Alien Nation SVU? And in the last five years, the newcomers have become the latest addition to the population of Los Angeles. These are their stories. More faux 1995 outfits. Those are never gonna get old. Go on. I'll have a treat for you when we get back. They've got her performing for treats like a dog. You newcomers drive me wild. Yeah, this is a little uncomfortable. Fortunately, it cuts to the next scene before it goes too far. The reclining platform should face southeast toward the galaxy Centaurus. The reclining platform should face that wall toward the fireplace. Speaking of outfits, no points for Uncle Mudry's fashion sense. Meanwhile... Spare the life of Captain John Smith, or if blood is to be shed, let it be mine. Emily is rehearsing for the school play. She's playing Pocahontas, that's interesting. You are going to have to get rid of your pets before the neighbors complain. They're not as pets, they're as companions. I mean, people I work with over for dinner, the idea is for them to see how alike we are to humans whose reclining platforms do not face the galaxy Centaurus. Oh, great father Powhatan, spare the life! I am going to work. Oh, George would rather deal with criminals than his family right now. I don't think Susan blames him. Later, it looks like someone is going to have to investigate the shooting of a black kid named Campbell by a newcomer, which should sound familiar. I should be assigned the case to demonstrate that I am not biased by my species. Uh, I think you will be biased, George. That's sweet, George, but naive. But the case ends up going to Dobbs, because if there's anyone who doesn't have any biases when it comes to newcomers, it's him. Just what happens when you promote them, Captain. You get uppity. So here's the thing about newcomers. When they're tense, they feel it in their feet instead of their necks. In George's case, he's having a dinner party and invited everyone from the force. And of course, his family wasn't cooperating earlier. What did you think of Alien Heart? So this is interesting. One of the subplots of this episode is that a TV movie had just aired. Some sort of romance starring newcomers. That tape I loan you. It's the first movie in which newcomers are given meaningful roles. Well, I only had a chance to watch half. They generally love it and appreciate the representation, but Matt didn't care for it. Well, look at your movies. Oh, wow, porn theaters still existed in 1989? Pretty sure they didn't by 1995, though. Anyway, according to George, newcomers aren't interested in purely physical relationships. No male would want it. No female would accept it. I thought Alien Heart expressed this well. George, you want to know the truth? Alien Heart is a bore. Uh-oh, Matt. And apparently the main actress in it is named Eleanor Roosevelt. Is that the one that kind of looks like a chipmunk? She is beautiful. <laughs> and brilliant. She'll be the first newcomer to win the Academy Award, you'll see. Matt pulls over when he sees the young newcomer prostitute from the beginning being threatened by a guy. Turns out he's got salt water. It's all right, it's all right, we're police. Jeez, George. I guess it's the tension. Do you know that man? No. I lost him. <gasps> he's gonna come back, he's gonna kill me. You don't know him, but you know he's gonna come back. What's your name? Mary. Mary Shelley. Mary Shelley, I love it. Matt gets right away that she's a prostitute, but naturally George is confused about this. A prostitute? Yeah. I can't believe that. She is tank to knees. You've seen newcomer hookers before, come on. Wait. He gets from her that her parents are in San Diego, so he gives her money for a bus ticket. Very smart, George. Giving a hooker money. That's very smart. But she doesn't know where the bus station is or how any of that works. She is so not. Nah. She has no self. She is still a slave. I have heard of this, but I have never seen it. He wants Matt to take her home and get her to the bus, which, of course, he's thrilled about. All her life, she has been controlled by someone. They click on Zoom, the overseers on our slave ship. And now her pimp. She's unable to think for herself. Sounds a bit like institutionalization. Well, then you take her home. I would, but I, uh, my kids, my uncle, uh, his goat. I... I think he's talking about how little room he has, but it sounds like he thinks the goat would be personally put out by having her there. Anyway, he pulls on Matt's heartstrings by reminding him that he has a daughter about her age. Would you want her to go to juvenile hall? Uh, okay, okay, I'll take her. So Matt gets Mary home, realizes that obviously there's nothing for her to change into, so he asks a very confused Kathy if she could donate a dress. 
I'll check. Somehow I can't see Kathy wearing that. Maybe that's why she got rid of it. So Matt takes her to the bus station and tells her what to do and sees her off. Wait a minute. What, no thank you, no nothing here? Thank you. Wait a minute. The collar's crooked. Aw. You gonna be okay? Yeah. Later he goes to George's house, but so far he's the only one there. Matt, guess what? I got a part in the school play! I missed Emily. She only had like one line of dialogue in the last episode. Did you see Eleanor Roosevelt in Alien Heart? I'm gonna be just like her. I suppose we should go ahead and eat. There's no telling when the others will get here. I love how every once in a while you can hear that goat in the background. Of course, George doesn't usually cook meat, so... I wasn't sure how long to cook the hamburgers. Do you think one hour is enough? Oof. One hour ought to do it. <laughs> Growing your own food? They're Uncle Mudry's companions. Buck is looking a bit more like a hippie than a punk now. Okay. Speaking of hippies... Thanks. Matt? Uncle Mudry. Hiya. I see why your feet hurt. I get the feeling George doesn't much care for Uncle Mudry, which makes Susan's line in the last episode funny. George will be so upset that he missed you. Yeah, that was bullshit. <laughs> They're letting Mudry guide the prayer, and it turns out he has a slightly different belief system. The goddess Ionia is our mother. The universe is her womb. All things come from the mother, all things return to the mother. As you can see, women play a significant role in this religion. George doesn't seem to care for that no either. Converting. He'd have no trouble converting my ex-wife. <laughs> oh, Matt, you deserve that reaction. George asks if Mary got on the bus okay, and Matt is just hoping that her family takes her back. Why wouldn't they? Well, uh, Mary's been in a little bit of trouble. It's all right. In this house, sex is discussed openly. Mary is a prostitute. Uh, What's a prostitute? This broccoli is delicious. Cue everyone being okay with discussing sex and prostitutes except Matt. I thought that was a gift you gave somebody when you loved them. Well, I know it's confusing, Emily. Well, Matthew's been with a prostitute. Perhaps he can explain. <laughs> a woman is sacred. And of course, Buck's got a pipe in. They treat us like things. They even treat their own kind like things. Mary is a newcomer. First they take away our identity. And our soul's polluted. Uh, so could I have some more salad, please? Well, I, I don't want to be a prostitute. I want to be an actress. Well, depending on the sort of movies you end up in, I'm not going to finish that sentence. Matt's like, thank God that's finally no, over. But then he finds Mary outside his apartment. But it looks like the wrong sort of person is watching. All right, so what's going on? It turns out that Mary doesn't actually have parents for all intents and purposes. I was taken away from them when I was a baby. He tells her she can sleep on the couch tonight, but tomorrow he's going to have to take her to juvenile affairs. It's my daughter. She's about eight then. Meanwhile, Buck's PTSD triggers a nightmare. After shooting the guy, suddenly he's younger and being taken away by an overseer. Fear no more, Phoenixa. Wow, so I guess Mudri is psychic or something? He was giving Buck kind of an interesting look in the previous episode, like he knew something. The next morning, Matt finds that Mary fell asleep clutching the picture of his daughter. It reminds her of her own lost youth, I guess. Is it time to go? Matt wants to give her breakfast, but all he has is peanuts, but she likes him. I got some instant coffee, maybe a tea. Peanuts are fine, I like peanuts. Matt asks her about the guy who was threatening her earlier. I stole money. My boyfriend told me to. From your pimp? A man I was sent to. Where's the money now? My boyfriend took it and he went away. Oh boy, this girl can't get a break. You don't understand the streets. Uh, there are laws. I know. I've been there. Well, Matt makes the mistake of leaving her there alone while he goes to work and tells her that he's got Alien Heart on VHS. Can you put it in? I want to see it. Wait, wait. Can you make it go fast? Okay, I have to look at these names. Starring Eleanor Roosevelt, Stop. Baton Rouge, Jesse James, and Dallas Fort Worth. 
Anyway, it turns out that a friend of hers is in the movie. Dallas. We have the same agent. Agent? Hmm. Okay, keep the door locked. Wait. Thank you. Yeah, she's gonna die. Dobbs gives his regrets to George for having missed the party. I understand. Oh, really? You know, we found a piece of newcomer's skin at the scene of the crime. We're running a make right now. That's great. Congratulations. Oh, George. Meanwhile, the name of the newcomer who comes up on the screen is Jim Brady. George, Matt tells him about Mary coming back and her situation. I had no idea it would be so complicated. Matt really doesn't want to take her to juvie. And she needs a home. Problem is, there ain't a big adoption market for 16-year-old hookers. She's used to me. I know what she likes for breakfast. Back at Matt's apartment complex, Kathy is leaving just in time to talk to this guy. I'm looking for my little sister, Mary. Mary Shelley. Yes, um, we've met. Well, she told me to pick her up at this address, but she didn't give me the apartment number. It's 203. I'll let you in. Oh, Kathy, what have you done? Meanwhile, Mudri is looking at a book that has a picture of a place that reminds him of their home planet, and he talks about what it was like. Blue. The deepest and most peaceful blue. A silver mist. Meadows full of a thousand stars. You were sad, Fadixa. Something happened. To... I don't know what to do. Can you tell me? He invites Buck to go with him to that place. He's in the sea, Uncle. The salt water will kill us. What's that? It's a place I'm going to with Uncle. Later, Matt comes home with some whale plushies for Mary. Yeah, I think we all saw that coming. It's still sad, though. Poor Matt. Oh, God. Later, Kathy is at the police station trying to identify the man that she let in, and of course she feels responsible. He's not here. I let him in. She'd be alive right now if I hadn't let him in. It's not your fault. May I go? Naturally, Matt does too and wants to nail the guy, but George doesn't think he should take the case because he's too involved. Ironic considering the case George wanted to take earlier. By the way, what even is Matt's outfit? He looks like he wanted to cosplay as the Hamburglar but forgot halfway through. You didn't come home and find that girl lying dead on your floor. I'm on this case. You don't like it, put in for a new partner. Speaking of costumes, we get to see Emily as Pocahontas. Oh god, the braids. That's certainly a look. It is you who gave me eyes to see the good in this world. To know the pure heart from the evil. Father, look into this man's heart and see the goodness there. Her talk of her father protecting her seems to really resonate with George. Let's nail that son of a bitch. Naha. The man who produced Alien Heart filmed it here. I, I, I just imagined some big studio in Hollywood. You know, George, Alien Heart ain't exactly Gone with the Wind. Oh, like you've ever seen Gone with the Wind, Matt. At least he didn't say Citizen Kane. Harry Marcus, LAPD. We like you. Well, go get him, guys. He thinks they're there to squeeze alimony out of him. We just want to ask you some questions. Oh, <laughs> okay. George asks him where they can find Mary's friend, Dallas. I don't know. My ex-partner, Mr. Casting Couch, he handled the newcomers. Matt asks how the guy went about finding the girls. The Bronte agency. <laughs> I remember because he was always saying how cooperative they were. You know? <laughs> cooperative? Easy, they put out. Where's this guy from, outer space? <laughs> I kind of like this guy. You don't mean Eleanor Roosevelt. Thanks for your help. Can't believe that. Eleanor Roosevelt? You'd think he was talking about the original Eleanor Roosevelt. Bronte. So Matt and George go to the Charlotte Bronte Agency undercover. We're producing the movie Butterfly Road. It's kind of a sequel to Cocoon 3. Cocoon 3, there we go with the sequel talk again. And then they end up meeting with the lady from the beginning. Fresh my memory, Mr. Long. What was your last picture? Pocahontas. The uh, love story. 
retold from a Tintinese point of view. I would totally watch that. Makes me think of that scene in The King and I where they did a Siamese ballet version of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Oh, great father Powhatan, hear thy daughter's cry. George hams it up more than Emily does. It's not out yet. Christmas. Mm. Well, my book is there. I'm sure you'll find a number of fine actresses. My friend, Harry Marcus, the producer of Alien Heart, mentioned that you might have some special girls. Girls who were... Slima. Slima. You know. Slima. You understand I have to be discreet. So there's a separate book for the cooperative ones, and naturally they find a picture of Mary. How about this one? Oh, I'm sorry. I should have taken that one out. She's no longer with our agency. Well, technically that's true. Then they find the picture of Dallas, and they request her. I believe she's available. Back to Buck, it looks like he's still hanging out with his friends. He's telling them about Uncle Mudri, but they don't seem too interested. Seems like they don't really care about their culture, and it's just an excuse to be punks. Take a massa. Anyway, Buck's friend gets arrested by Dobbs. Later, George meets with Dallas. I'm Huey Long. Huey Long was a former governor of Louisiana. I was wondering if you might do for me what you did for my friend, Harry Marcus. Miss Bronte said this was going to be straight up. Half and half will cost you extra. He offers her money and... Okay. And as she makes it clear what he's paying for, Matt shows up and arrests her. It's not as bad as all that. If you help us, we will drop the charges. No. They tell her about Mary and how they want her to help find her killer. You're lying. No. Campbell says Swavos is not the slag who shot him. Now we get Swavos to finger the guy, and I'm going to make the collar of my lifetime. I mean, every reporter within 100 miles is going to be there watching me play Dick Tracy. Back to the station, Dobbs is questioning Buck's friend, and we're left wondering if he's going to rat Buck out or not. Meanwhile, they've put a wire on Dallas. This is Dorian Gray. You handle all the rough stuff? Dorian Gray. The girl's holding back. She sends Dorian. All right. Dallas, we have got to connect Charlotte with Dorian. We think that Charlotte had him kill Mary over some money she stole. Yeah, let's find out if Charlotte Bronte had Dorian Gray kill Mary Shelley. I love this show. Anyway, George sets it up by telling Bronte about a party he invited Dallas to, which she didn't tell her about. I'm sure she'll let you know. Yes, I'm sure she will. And she calls Dallas in for a meeting and also calls Dorian. Dallas, dear, this is for Mr. Long. Thank you. Did you and Mr. Long make any other plans? No. Really? Well, that's too bad. I thought you'd hit it off. Oh, I've made arrangements for you to have another date. For this afternoon. This afternoon? Mm -hmm. As in, this afternoon, this afternoon? Drive Dallas to this address, please. Yes, ma'am. And of course, he's in the car when she gets there. Hello, Dallas. Pretty Dallas. Stupid Dallas. You know what happens to girls who rip off Charlotte? Dorian Gray sure likes to ham it up. That feels appropriate. Matt and George are right behind them, but another car gets in the way. What are you doing? So Matt plays chicken with the driver. 90% of the time they get out of the way. It leaves 10%. Meanwhile, Dorian admits to having killed Shelly. Here's a little reminder. A taste of the Blue Pacific. Heh, <laughs> 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 serves him right. <laughs> then he finds out she's wired. You're dead! They had a hard time getting there, but Matt and George show up just in time to arrest him. Oh, come on, try it! Please. Poor Dallas is pretty shaken, but she's alive. You're under arrest. You have the right to remain silent. Then they arrest Bronte. Take innocence, you sell it, and you destroy it. Who turns out to be an overseer. That's what that tattoo on her wrist means. Don't worry about it, George. She's in for life, and that don't begin to pay the bill. Back at the station, going by the look on Dobbs' face, he probably found out what Buck did and isn't looking forward to telling George about it. George, 
We got some bad news. The kid we arrested, he identified the newcomer who shot Campbell. It's your son. Sure enough. I'm sorry, man. It's a mistake. We gotta bring him in. I'm really sorry, man. George offers to bring him in. Sure. Meanwhile, Mudri and Buck are at the shore. Willis. And somehow he steps into the water unharmed. How the hell does that work? Wow. I am part of it. It is part of me. Come, Phoenixa. Believe that, and the water can't hurt you. I don't have your faith. There's no shame in that. Buck gets surprisingly honest here. I don't know where I belong or who I am. With each breath, you join this earth. Saying I belong here? I hate this world. All worlds are stardust. This world, our world, we are stardust. You carry a wound. You know about the shooting. It turns out that Mudri came to visit in the first place because he knew what happened with Buck and that he needed help getting back on track. I didn't, I didn't mean to hurt anybody. I didn't, I didn't want to do it. Help me. Nixa, this is your world. Embrace it. Take responsibility for what you do here. He basically tells him, trust the people who love you, and that's when George shows up. Dad. Buck confesses before George gets the chance to even think thing. about taking him in by force. I have to go to the police. Oh. We end on a voiceover from Buck's trial. The sentence is as follows. Two years in a correctional institution. Suspended. Buck Francisco is remanded to the custody of his parents and placed on probation for three years. Second chance granted. And so ends Little Lost Lamb. I liked this one a lot. We get to see Matt's parental instincts kick in as he grows attached to a young newcomer girl who is a prostitute, no less. And Buck's subplot from the pilot is resolved. Also, we get to see more of Uncle Mudri. I kind of have mixed feelings about him. He has a fun personality and I like learning more about newcomer culture through him. But the mystical aspects with him feel a little out of place on this show that's otherwise pretty grounded. I don't know, is he proof that newcomers have latent magical properties? I guess that's interesting, but I just don't know how I feel about that. We also learn that prostitution is a concept completely alien to the newcomer, so to speak. I guess another thing I have a bit of a problem with is how newcomers only having sex in long-term relationships is framed like one of the ways that they're superior. I mean, casual sex isn't my thing, but if other people want to do it, so what? As long as everyone involved is a consenting adult. Of course, this was just George's perspective, and the point of this show is to show humanity from an outsider's perspective, so maybe that was all they were going for. On a lighter note, they really had fun with the naming convention in this one. Not only did they have a lot of familiar names, but two of them were authors and the other was a book character and title. And when George met with Dallas Fort Worth, he told her his name was that of a former governor of Louisiana. All of that was fun. There was also an overarching theme of parenting and just generally guiding children in the right direction. When George is watching Emily talk about her father as Pocahontas, it inspires him to help Matt find Mary's killer. And of course it ends with Buck being led back to him for guidance and protection. I guess that's about all I can think of to say about this one. Next up is 15 with Wanda. See you then. Matt, do you ever pay for sex? No! Well, you know, once or twice when I was young. Why do you ask me questions like that for? 